This month marks the 25th anniversary of the reunification of Germany. And among uh, the many things that uh, Senator Dan Coats has done, um, he was the United States ambassador to Germany mm -hmm. from 2001 to 2005. He arrived in Germany just days before um, the 9-11 uh, mm -hmm. attacks and was on the front lines dealing with the response because if you recall, um, the, the, the terror cell that attacked the United States actually came out of Hamburg, Germany. So he was very much involved in that and I'm sure he'll have something to say about that or answer some of your questions about that. Um, let me just, uh, uh, and, and then afterwards also I'd like to say that uh, after our event and after the questions and answers, we will have a reception, um, as we always do. So you'll be able to meet Senator Coates and we'll be able to meet uh, Council General Keller. And the reception is co-sponsored by the American Council on Germany. So um, I'd like to thank uh, Sven for making all that possible. Um, and I think it's going to be a very exciting evening. So let me uh, introduce uh, our speaker tonight. Um, Dan Coates is senator for, uh, the senior senator um, from Indiana. He has been um, serving uh, in this capacity since uh, 2010, 2010 election. However, this is his second stint as a U.S. Senator. He was a United States Senator for, uh, um, from, um, excuse me, until uh, 1999. And uh, he, he uh, actually filled the seat that was vacated by Dan Quayle when Dan Quayle became um, Vice President of the United States. And then um, Senator Coates was elected in his own right. And before that, he was also in the U.S. Congress. He. Um, uh, served his nation in the U.S. Army, and then he went to um, and he went to Wheaton College, and then he has a law degree from IU School of Law, and then he worked uh, as an, for an insurance company in Fort Wayne, and uh, then, then started his uh, political career, first working um, for Congressman Dan Quayle, and then uh, eventually going into Congress himself. After his time as ambassador, um, he was U.S. Senator, then ambassador to Germany. After that, he worked in the law firm, um, and continued to be active in public service. He served as president of Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America, and is on the boards of many civic and volunteer organizations. Senator Coates formed the Foundation for American Renewal with his wife, Marcia, to continue their work uh, related to faith-based initiatives. And again, he joined the U.S. Senate again for his second stint in, two, in, in 2011, following 2010 elections. Um, and uh, in this current uh, Congress, the 112th Congress, Senator Coates is serving on four committees in the Senate, Appropriations, Select Intelligence, Energy and Natural Resources, and he's chair of the Joint Economic Committee. And I'd like to also uh, just acknowledge that when we do go to Washington, D.C. for the last few years um, and take students there, we, we uh, have a really nice meeting with Senator Coates and also with his uh, senior foreign policy advisor, Terry Snell, um, who was a former uh, foreign service officer with Senator Coates in Berlin. Um, and, 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 and Terry gives our students a briefing on careers in the foreign service, and it's a fantastic thing. And also, Senator Coates' office in Washington helps me set up some of the tours that we set up uh, with uh, the Supreme Court, staff led tour of the Capitol, Library of Congress, things like that. So it's been a real pleasure working with your office and with Senator Coates. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Dan Coates. I want to make sure everybody can hear. Is this loud enough? Good enough? I got a, this on too, so uh, I don't want to be too loud. But it, anyway, I want to uh, thank you, Pierre, uh, for the introduction. I appreciate that. President Elsner, um, as we were talking out in the hall, uh, the last time I was here, we were turning yeah. the dirt with a shovel for this building. <laughs> and it's remarkable to come back and see such a gorgeous piece of architecture and building. And, New School of Osteopathy, um, see the magnificent growth of Marion University. So my hats off to you. Congratulations to everyone that has uh, made this possible. I'm honored that the uh, German Council General has uh, come down here to uh, uh, hear me speak. Uh, my good friend Sven Schumacher, uh, we reunited. We spent a lot of time interchanging with each other uh, while I was ambassador to Germany. Jenny Kane, who works for our office, and a lot of people who um, it's a pleasure just to be back here with. Now, I told them on the way in, look, this is a Friday night. Uh, how many students are here? Raise your hands. Let me see how many students. Wow. Now, they ought to get extra credit. I'm really impressed because I told them, I said, if I was a student here, it's a Friday night, I wouldn't come to hear me speak. <laughs> So I hope that uh, it can be worth your while, but I do appreciate you turning out and for others that are here. Um, I appreciate that very much. Well, as uh, Pierre mentioned, um, uh, I've had somewhat of an unusual uh, career. Not many, uh, in fact, very, very few have served two terms, two, I mean, in the Senate. Uh, 
on two different occasions with a pretty big gap uh, in between. And it's, it's a long, long story in terms of how all this happened. It, it wasn't through ambition, it wasn't through uh, my own doing. Uh, some doors opened and others closed and things happened and uh, circumstances changed that, that, that made all that possible. But when, in my first term, uh, when I moved from the House of Representatives to the United States Senate, uh, I had the great privilege of serving with uh, Senator Dick Lugar. And uh, so it's an honor to be speaking uh, here at the uh, uh, Lugar series. And I wish and hope that I can be here when he speaks. I'm going to check my calendar. I didn't realize that he was speaking in a couple of months. So, uh, well, I had the great privilege of inheriting uh, the opportunity to serve with Senator Lugar and particularly someone so steeped in foreign policy. Uh, at the time uh, I arrived at the Senate, I made the decision that, look, we don't need two Indiana people on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, even though I had an interest there. So I was on the, uh, uh, went on the military side, was on the Senate Armed Services Committee as well as the Senate Intelligence Committee. Um, and that allowed, I think, the two of us uh, to balance out some very important uh, responsibilities uh, that we had as, uh, as, as senators. Uh, but I always looked at Dick Luger as a, a good mentor and someone uh, steeped in foreign policy issues. And so um, uh, I, I stayed with uh, committees uh, and, and was not totally engaged. Every senator is engaged because the Constitution gives us the goodbyes and consent uh, uh, treaty uh, confirmations and so forth. Uh, so. A big duty of the Senate is, is to deal with foreign policy issues, but they're segregated in terms of committee assignments and how much effort and time you're, you're putting in, into all that. Well, I left the Senate and to honor a term limits pledge, and I left in uh, early uh, 1999, uh, not thinking that I would be back into public service. But uh, a year later, after the election of George W. Bush, uh, the President asked if I would uh, take the position of ambassador to Germany. And after some deliberation, um, because I wasn't exactly sure whether I wanted to leave the country, be away for almost a four year period of time. Um, kids, some of the kids were, well, the kids were just leaving the house, so that made it easier, moving off, off to college. And so we said yes. Uh, after I got there, I, I uh, realized that I should have said yes within two seconds of being asked because it turned out to be one of the most extraordinary experience, with the most extraordinary experience of my life. I have some incredible memories of that. Uh, as Pierre said, we arrived the weekend uh, in early September and the very first thing, official uh, event that I uh, needed to go to was the uh, dedication of the Holocaust Museum in Berlin. He drew people from all over the world, obviously given the history on this issue, uh, this, was, this was quite an occasion. And I was seated at a table quite a long ways from the front, but at the table on my left was Richard Holbrook, who, uh, in fact, there's just a movie and a book coming out, I think, about him. One of the storied uh, foreign uh, service uh, individuals uh, well known for his work on uh, settling the Bosnia situation and, and quite a force. And on my right was Henry Kissinger. <laughs> it was like a ping pong match uh, because the two of them were going at it, uh, not on the same page necessarily, but literally two of the most brilliant minds relative to uh, foreign policy uh, in the world. And so I was listening to Holberg talking past me. Uh, to Kissinger, and then Kissinger would respond, so I'm going like this all night long. <laughs> it was about a three-hour event, and it was like a postgraduate course in foreign policy. That was my introduction to uh, diplomacy uh, on, in a real-life situation, not just academic, not just as a committee member uh, or a member of the United States Senate, but in a real-life experience. That was Sunday evening, uh, September 9. 2001. Uh, on Monday, 2010, um, Marcia and I they took the occasion. We had four separate locations for the embassy in Berlin, and we went. We wanted to introduce ourselves to uh, 
people who would be working with us and for us. Uh, and we kind of made the rounds, I found out where my office was going to be and so forth. And the very, I had asked the staff earlier, uh, set up for me uh, someone that I can sit down with and learn about the history of Germany post-World War II uh, to the present. I said, I, I want to learn as much as I can about this unique relationship following uh, uh, the end of, of World War II. And we set it up for a luncheon at the residence and uh, went down in the morning, did a few things, and then uh, came back for this luncheon. And up, drive, up the driveway uh, walked an 88-year-old German Jew named Ernst Kramer, Dr. Ernst Kramer. Ernst Kramer was a 17-year-old when he and his family and all the relatives were rounded up by the Nazis and sent to the concentration camp at Buchenwald. His family bribed his way out of there uh, by collecting all their rings and diamonds and watches and so forth, bribed his way out of there and somehow into, uh, uh, into the United States, where he was living on a farm in Mississippi, uh, attending, I think, a senior in high school. December 7th occurred, and Ernst Kramer was standing in line at the Army Recruiting Center the next day, saying, I want to join the U.S. Army. I am German. I can be helpful. You'll need an interpreter. And um, uh, I'm ready to sign up. And he did sign up. He was one of the first to land at Normandy because they needed interpreters, uh, not on the initial wave, but very shortly afterward. And uh, then stayed uh, uh, in the effort, and ended up near the end of the war with a unit that liberated Buchenwald, only to find that all of his family uh, had perished. He then went on, dedicated his life to, he was so grateful for uh, the United States and the Allied forces uh, ridding the plague of, of Nazi socialism in Germany, um, that he became, uh, joined, uh, went into the media, went into journalism, and ended up becoming editor of, the Germans, uh, of uh, Germany's largest uh, newspaper. Uh, he it was in semi-retirement, but still wrote a column every week. And Ernst sat down and talked me through uh, this unique, post-World War II relationship, unlike any other. At the, there's a six-hour time difference. This is 911. There's a six-hour time difference between Germany and the East Coast here, uh, Eastern Standard Time. And so it, it was getting quite late. It was uh, well after two in the afternoon, because we didn't start the lunch till 12.30, it went on much longer. And he said that at about, uh, at about 2 30 German time, 8 30 US time, he said, I've taken way too much of your time. Uh, I said, No, this has just been fascinating. It's the most perfect thing I could have done to start my tenure as ambassador in Germany. He said, But I can't leave until I bring up one last subject, one last issue that I think your country and my country and the free world. Is going to have to deal with. And that is the rise of Islamic fundamentalism and the potential issues that will come out of that. We spent quite a bit of time talking about that. And as I escorted him to the front door and watched him down, I walked down the driveway that he had walked up. My staff, my cell phone, my phone, my staff came and said, turn on, the staff just called from the embassy, turn on CNN. With a uh, son-in-law in the United States Army, who I had visited just about five days before to say goodbye, uh, in the part of the Pentagon that I watched the plane plow into, and another son-in-law who was scheduled to have breakfast at the World Trade Center with his company, um, it was. Uh, there were several hours, and thankfully, uh, both of them uh, survived. My 
son-in-law in the Pentagon crawling out from the rubble with his commanding officer and intern uh, uh, and associate uh, all killed. Um, it was a very emotional day. In the meantime, uh, we, did, we had an American flag out in front of our embassy building, and we didn't know what was happening. And watching the two plane, the second plane hit, I didn't see the first, watching the second plane hit and then learning about the plane in Pennsylvania and the plane into the, into the Pentagon, uh, anybody connected with uh, the American uh, connection uh, potentially could have been at risk. We didn't know really what was happening. And so it was a mad scramble to um, determine who should stay at the embassy and who should be sent home and how we were going to prepare for this. And the Germans provided very excellent uh, coverage for us. And then it, at late in the evening, um, it was dark. It was like the first time I could just ah, take a breath. I walked over to the window, opened the curtains, and looked down in front of the embassy. And there were hundreds of Germans kneeling, lighting candles, laying flowers, and it was, I just, I broke down. I mean, it was just all the tension of the day, wondering what's happening to our son-in-laws, um, watching the horror of what's, what had happened in New York and in Washington and Pennsylvania, and then dealing with all the emergency situations and things that we had to do. Um, but that began, the, uh, I walked out of the embassy and went down to thank them. And I'll never forget the German woman who said, you were here when we needed you the most, and we want to be here when you need us the most, and that's why we are here. And that started a, a love affair for the next seven months, which unfortunately turned into uh, where, where we were grateful. I found myself three days later standing at the Brandenburg Gate, uh, where Ronald Reagan had said, uh, tear down this wall, uh, speaking to uh, tens of thousands, if not more, uh, Germans and on live TV all over the country, uh, thanking them for their generosity, for the teddy bears, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of teddy bears they had sent to send these to the children in New York who lost their father or lost their mother. Uh, the, the, the enormous contributions of, of funds uh, for that. And for the next seven months, uh, it was an extraordinary time as we feverishly worked uh, to coordinate, as Beer said, the, the, uh, uh, those who flew the planes uh, came out of Hamburg, so uh, the prosecution uh, was there, the investigation was there. Uh, Germany is a central place for a lot of our services throughout all of Europe and, and Africa. And so coordinating uh, and being part of, and working with the military and so forth, uh, became quite an extraordinary uh, experience, all the way literally through uh, through my time. And so the real life experience of uh, what I thought a diplomat would, would uh, engage in uh, turned out to be something uh, completely different. So I came back and uh, uh, was in the private sector for quite some time and then in 2010 uh, in response to a call I, I said to my wife, I said, you know, um, call to come back and get engaged and run for the Senate again. Uh, I said, I, I think what the mistake I made was stop, failure to stop at a psychiatrist's office uh, before I made my decision. <laughs> and I, I, you know, are you crazy? Why do you want to go back and do this all over again? But I'm now in Senate 2.0, and once again, I had the opportunity to share uh, the Senate with Senator Luger. Uh, unfortunately, he lost the election in 2012. I then became the senior senator, and I felt, um, although I, I wasn't going to be able to walk in his shoes, uh, I should shift my focus uh, to, to foreign policy and, as senior senator, uh, take on that role. I was fortunate to have, uh, as uh, Pierre mentioned, Terry Snell, 32 years of service. He was my deputy chief of mission in Berlin. Uh, we had been working together uh, in Washington when I was in the private sector, and I brought him on, and he's just been a gift to me in terms of uh, working through a whole range of foreign policy issues that we've had to deal with uh, in the United States Senate. So I'm, I'm grateful for his, for his help. I want to shift now just uh, briefly here to my view. Uh, it's not everybody's view, but my view of the current foreign policy situation 
of, of this uh, administration, uh, now the Obama administration. Historically, uh, presidents from Truman to Kennedy to Reagan uh, to Nixon and others, historically, historically, uh, in, <clears throat> frankly, in the 20th century, most of the 20th century uh, and, and continuing, uh, America's foreign policy was based on principally uh, the idea of exceptionalism. We were a country that was uh, formed for a unique uh, reason and played a unique role in world affairs, promoting democracy, uh, promoting freedom, uh, and uh, much of our foreign policy centered around that concept. Uh, but uh, when President Obama took office, um, there were some questions about, uh, and he made several statements uh, indicating that that wasn't the direction he thought America ought to go for in the future. And without getting into whether that was the right decision or wrong decision, um, I thought I would just, I thought the measurement ought to be uh, relative to the policy. What are the have been the consequences? And what have been the results uh, of that policy? You know, famously the president said in, on Air Force One, uh, when press were basically saying, well, Mr. President, what is your foreign policy? We don't see, have a clear definition of, of, of what our strategy is and what our foreign policy is. And, and um, as was reported, he angrily said, just don't something stupid. Don't do stupid. Uh, well, that created quite a stir. Uh, maybe those weren't quite the right way to describe that. I think he was frustrated when he, when he said it. Uh, but as we have looked at various incidents that have been playing out around the world. We've gotten a better a look and a better idea as to uh, the policy that we have adapted uh, under this administration and a look at, at the consequences of that. And so, um, again, without getting into the politics of it, uh, I just listed a number of things here uh, in terms of consequences and results uh, that I think, in, to a large extent, uh, 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 are reflective uh, of that policy, uh, the policy that has been different than what traditionally has been held. Uh, it all, uh, I'm going I'm to just name a few uh, examples. The, uh, did this turn off? You still hear me? Yeah. Uh, the uh, decision uh, after, uh, you know, we've gone through some very, very difficult times uh, with Iraq, and I can tell you lots of uh, issues related to my interaction uh, with uh, the German government and the German people in that regard. They did not support our effort, and uh, the uh, president and the chancellor were, um, after that first seven months of love affair, there were some real tension and some real clashes uh, between the two. I found myself in the middle of that. Part of my job was to stay connected to and hopefully trusted uh, by uh, top German government officials so that I could accurately report back. Uh, that was my job to the president and to his security advisors and to the State Department. Uh, Colin Powell was Secretary of State at the time. Uh, and so to do be effective with that, I had to maintain that relationship. At the same time, uh, uh, I was representing the United States and and representing the President of the United States. And there was, uh, uh, that was a tightrope. That was a balance beam that I had to keep both sides of that open if I was going to effectively uh, do my job. Um, but uh, that's a side effect, a side fact here that we can talk about perhaps at another time. But as Iraq was winding down, uh, as the public was becoming exhausted, uh, over our inability to uh, bring about the result that we had hoped uh, and all the debate that went into all the issues related to that. The decision to withdraw all of our troops from Iraq, uh, in my opinion, uh, left a void, uh, which then uh, overcame what we had achieved in hard-fought uh, efforts through the surge uh, and created a, a it's, it's still a period of very significant, uh, almost chaos uh, uh, in Iraq. And the president at the time said the real war is Afghanistan. 
And now we're faced with a situation where uh, the same type of drawdown, uh, but hopefully leaving a residual force, and you probably have read and heard where the President has said, uh, we will uh, extend the time that our troops are there. Uh, many think that uh, had we left that residual force in Iraq, uh, the rise of ISIS uh, could not have been uh, successful. Uh, that's debatable. Uh, but nevertheless, the vacuum that was left with no presence, I think, was not a consequence that we had, we had hoped for. Uh, Libya came along, and um, we, uh, the term leading from behind uh, came because the United States did not take a forward uh, action on that. Actually, the French, while we were debating what to do or whether to do, uh, the French decided, and it was a former French colony, uh, decided to take action, which we reluctantly joined with later. Uh, the amazing thing is, is that we've never looked to France to be a leader in taking uh, any kind of aggressive action. In fact, back in the uh, my early time in, in the Senate, uh, as we were preparing for a desert storm uh, to uh, take Iraq out of uh, Kuwait, uh, that the elaborate presentation, I remember uh, Vice President Cheney uh, and a few of us uh, giving us a briefing uh, in terms of what the battle plan was going to be. Uh, this was all classified at the time, but now it's been, I can say it because it's become public, but you know, the Marines would come on, on shore here uh, as a feint. Uh, this uh, division of the Army would go here. That was a partial feint also to get the Iraqis to think that we're coming in here and not there, and there was the left hook, so forth and so on. And he was telling us where the various nations that had joined us, where they were and how they were going to participate. And someone said, well, where are the French? Because the British were here, and the others were here, and so forth, there, and so forth and so on. Uh, and he said, well, they're over here, but the map isn't big enough. And we put them over there because we think they're totally inept. Uh, they're not going to be able to help us at all, and we wanted to get them out of the way so they wouldn't mess things up. Here we are in Libya, and the French are flying the warplanes, and the French are intervening, urging us to come and join them. So for me, it was quite a contrast uh, between uh, the decisions of, of two, very different, uh, two very different leaders. Along comes Ukraine, um, and uh, we watched uh, as Putin, on his will, had his will, uh, Breach the sovereignty of a sovereign nation uh, without, uh, essentially, uh, uh, there was a rhetorical response. Uh, it was very much a part of that. Uh, but um, the signal that it sent was to NATO and to a lot of Europe, particularly those bordering uh, Russia, was, uh, do you still have our back? Are we going to be the next? Georgia had, parts of Georgia had fallen, had been taken by the Russians. We didn't respond. I'm not saying we should have responded by invasion or, or action, but the response was such that it, it created a lot of uncertainty with our allies in Europe as to whether or not they could count on the United States, whether or not NATO had the capability then of deterring further Russian uh, aggression. Um, Syria, the president, um, uh, drew the red line with the use of chemical weapons, if you remember. And then within days, withdrew that. And that sent yet another signal that even when you made a declarative decision um, uh, on, on responding uh, to an issue that you think deserves response to, three days later, the president, or shortly later thereafter, the president changed his mind and said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, yet another symbol and another signal that, well, a lot of confusion here about whether the United States is going to do anything. Can we count on that? And we have been seen as a leader in foreign policy around the world, uh, obviously uh, uh, the war in Iraq in particular uh, had exhausted the American people and there was little support for any kind of massive invasion but the question still is what type of leadership and strength and putting coalitions together and so forth. And so on and on it went. Um, we, Director Clapper of the uh, Director of National Intelligence 
has told our intelligence committee, and he's now said it uh, uh, publicly, uh, he said, in my 51 years of intelligence service, I have never seen a situation in the world like this. There are so many hot, the world's on fire. There are so many hot spots in so many different places. And it's there because we have created and left the vacuum that uh, is being filled by a lot of bad guys, by a lot of people with evil intentions, a lot of people who see this, who see the United States as unwilling, either and, and weak and, or inept, um, uh, in terms of dealing with these uh, issues. Our strategy in Syria to deal with what has been a declared policy, and that is to rid Syria of the leadership of Assad. Um, and therefore, we were training and supporting Syrian freedom fighters so that could, they could achieve that goal. As a member of the Intelligence Committee, we had authorization over a program which was then covert, but is now public, uh, uh, in terms of that training. And so several of us, uh, not that many months ago, uh, were in Jordan in the desert and in Turkey in the desert where this training was taking place. I had great skepticism about the possibility of success for this and uh, had said uh, that I could not continue to support it unless I saw us getting better uh, results. Uh, we tragically have learned that uh, after spending $500 million in training, uh, the number of people trained uh, who haven't been captured, killed, uh, or walked away uh, is, in, is uh, uh, around in the 10 to 15 range. Uh, it's a total, total disaster, leaving a situation in Syria that is almost unthinkable right now with hundreds, uh, thousands, and millions and millions of people uh, joining the migration which is another whole issue taking place in Europe. And I just got back from Greece and Italy looking at that uh, factor, which is uh, having en enormous consequences in, in Europe. There's just so many things going on here. I feel like I, go, I could go on for three or four hours, and I've just given you uh, uh, some of the highlights of that. The last thing I want to say is the, uh, uh, the nuclear agreement uh, reached between the administration, which was highly controversial, as you know, um, added some fuel to the fire in terms of whether our strategies are the right strategies and whether our resolve is the right resolve. Uh, none other than David Brooks in the New York Times said we went into these negotiations with eight core issues. And those core issues, uh, each one of those eight, he said, was over time conceded to the Iranians. And we didn't, have, didn't achieve, this is David Brooks, I'm quoting here, uh, commercially. Uh, uh, we did not achieve any one of the eight core issues that we had placed on the table and said we have to achieve these if we're going to have a viable agreement. Four previous presidents, two Democrats and two Republicans, had said it is totally unacceptable for Iran ever to have nuclear weapons capability. It would create a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. It would threaten uh, Israel's existence. Uh, it could lead to a nuclear holocaust, and we must prevent it at all costs. Two Democrat senators, uh, the presidents, and two Republicans, the previous, including this, this current president. And we now have conceded that because we know that in a period of time, uh, they will. Uh, we have built the pathway for them to have the nuclear weapon and agreed that they should have that capability. I want to close, um, though, on a more... Uh, Hopeful note, I, I could go on and discuss the uh, resurgence of the Taliban in Afghanistan and now ISIS uh, in Afghanistan, uh, the increasing role of Iran and Iraq, where we sacrificed so much, the war in Yemen and threats to the Saudi Arabia and Jordan, the uh, chaos in Somalia, Mali, uh, Sub-Sahara, uh, the Boko Haram in uh, Nigeria, uh, instability in Turkey, uh, who's a NATO ally, uh, China rising uh, in the other side of the globe, uh, threatening sovereignty of its neighbors and America's naval dominance, uh, and then the migration issue, which is an uh, extremely difficult and volatile thing. And so I have come to the conclusion, uh, you may not agree, but I've come to the conclusion uh, that I am not able to find a single issue or problem 
where this administration's policy uh, has been uh, successful. Uh, to me, uh, it, it is not the right policy. To me, Latin America has lost its credibility among its allies and its continents among its allies. It has lost the element of strength and fear among its adversaries and left vacuums around the world and in very difficult places in the world that are being filled by all the wrong people and many, many millions are suffering as a result. So, uh, to read what I recently wrote, uh, in some I'm, I'm very concerned about America, a place in the, America's place in the world and how weakness and inaction have, have harmed it. Uh, abroad, we're increasingly seen as a spent force, exhausted by interminable wars, politically divided and inert, financially strained and floundering without firm, articulate, determined leadership. That's, that's a tough note to end on. So I want to end on a positive note. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with that name, said, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. And just as I look back over my own life, uh, at times when we seem to be in a pretty desperate situation, uh, Americans have rallied, have rallied to the cause. And so, again, as I wrote, um, uh, Alexis uh, de Tocqueville's uh, quote has proven uh, throughout our nation's history that we uh, have experienced periods of time of diminished uh, world influence and, and, and domestic turmoil, yet time after time the world believed that America's decline was inevitable, but under the present, uh, under presidents who have stepped up, leaders that who, who have stepped up, uh, international respect for our country has been restored. The Cold War was brought to a conclusion. Our country adapted to challenges facing throughout the world. This has been our history. And today, our country is still a country of immense capability, immense potential. Uh, I still think we're a beacon of hope for people. I think we, in the rest of the world, I think we can restore that. And uh, uh, we have an election coming up. Don't ask me who's going to be our nominee. I think we might know now who the Democrat nominee is, but we need someone to step up, whoever that might be, uh, to give us that clear vision for the future. And I think to return to our rightful place is that city on the hill that has been so important in the affairs of the world, uh, the quest for peace uh, through strength, someone who can provide a rational argument that uh, freedom and democracy are truly what we all should be aimed at. I'm going to stop there and then say thank you. I don't know if we do questions or not. I'm happy to do that. I don't, don't, don't want to hold anybody longer than they need to be. But thank you very much for allowing me to come and, and tell you a little bit about uh, my uh, foray into issues of foreign affairs and then tell you where my thinking is right now.